I'm here today to talk about product management and gender and kind of what are, what's the, what are the parts of the product management experience which is in and of itself kind of unique from the engineering experience and how are women product managers impacted by those things in some ways even more than product managers in general are. So right now at Yelp, I work on the search box, I work on Suggest, I work on photo quality, I work on review summarization, and I work on review sorting. Um, I got brought on because I came from Google, for, where I worked for seven and a half years on a variety of different search problems, and I really love search. I love ranking problems, I love classification problems. Like, I'm happy to go and like look at uh, like a, 500 queries for four hours, just because like I find it really fun. Like you should find things that you love, and then you should go do them. And uh, our roadmap for today is I want to go over a little bit about what is product management and what is, why does gender matter, and then I'll give you a bunch of unsolicited advice at the end about how to navigate some of the things I'm going to talk about. So before I dive into what I see as like the particular gendered problems of product management, which are going to be really big downers, I want to make sure we talk about why product management is really great. Because you might go, Francis, why would you do this to yourself? Like, you're going to get up here and complain for five minutes about like what's wrong with product management. Like, why, why don't you just go code? Um, I think the biggest part for me is if you can dream it, you can build it. Like, I've, 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 I've had. Um, I've been in environments where there was, it seemed insurmountable odds were against us, but we knew there was something that we thought was meaningful out there, and we went out there and we did it. Like, we launched the mobile book reader at, at Google, and I still remember what my own product director said, which was like, why would anyone want to read a book on a phone? That seems ridiculous. Um, and like a little group of us went and, and like worked on it for like 14 months as like our 20% project and like we launched it. And I think from that moment on I was like, oh my god, like this is, this is why I was put on earth. Like I was put on earth to have, help people have experiences that were meaningful to them with technology. I think the second is I really like teams. Like I really like coaching people. I really like protecting people, which is actually I think a big part of what product managers do. Like we make space for people. And I like, I like leading teams, like it makes me really happy. And the last one is impact, that like inherent in the concept of a product manager is that we're force multipliers, that we help engineers accomplish more than they would on their own, and we help things that would otherwise be impossible come into being. And at the same time, there's a lot of humility that comes with product management. Like, there's nothing quite as humbling as replacing a product manager, because you realize the team continues without you. Like, you're not actually that important. But at the same time, like you can go in there and do things that allow people to be twice as effective or three times as effective as they would be on their own. And uh, one of my big life goals is to help people live their lives more. Like you should, um, there's so many, there, like our lives are so short and so precious and we should go out there and be able to do as much as we can and like live as vividly. And as a product manager, I get to help people do that and that's why I do product management. So before I dive into tech, I want to do a tangent to the world of banking. Uh, so I have an MBA, um, which some people are like, why would you do that? Um, but uh, in the process of getting an MBA, I learned about all these other industries. And one of the things I was really shocked by was how many women presidents, vice presidents, executive vice presidents there are in major billion dollar banks. Like basically every billion dollar bank doesn't just have like their token vice president who's a woman. They have multiple vice presidents that are women. And like, all the stereotypes you have about banking are generally true. Like, it's a macho place. It's a place where like, they reward, I don't say they would reward, because they would never say that. But in some ways, they incentivize bad behavior. Like, there's a lot of things about banking that I think are incredibly toxic. And yet, why do they have women leaders? Uh, <laughs> So I think the answer to this question is really simple, which is show me the Benjamins, right? Like they have an incredibly objective evaluation function. They have money. Like no one argues with money, at least in that world. People who bring in more money, they get promoted. And as a result, you see women executives, you see women executives, and you don't see them in major tech companies. And when you do see them in major tech companies, you see them in places that are, are uh, support roles, like marketing or perhaps sales. And I think that's a problem. 
And I think part of the reason why that matters is product management is at the opposite end from banking. So people like to talk about how engineering is objective. Uh, I don't think it is. We can talk about that offline. Uh, but product management is even more subjective. Like everywhere from the very beginning when you come up with an idea and you have to start building consensus around it through navigating kind of the design trade-offs or technical trade-offs or, or securing resources, those are all highly subjective phases. You have to persuade people. You have to build trust with them. You have to have people have faith in you. And in all those places, like, it's a lot harder than arguing about is this investment going to have a higher ROI than that investment? Another part that makes it hard for women is that we have, um, in many organizations, product management is kind of a secondary organization. You know, it's kind of viewed as like, where do people go who have CS degrees but maybe don't want to code? Um, and I feel this kind of acutely because I don't have a CS degree. Like, I'm a very, very technical PM. I love to code. Like, I wrote the logs analysis library for Google Books that was used up to the point where I quit. Um, and I learned all of that at Google. Like, I don't really know why they hired me. Uh, <laughs> I got asked like the one technical question in my technical interview that I could have answered. And I only did that because I was forced to take like this data mining cl class when I studied abroad in Sweden. It's a long story. Um, but it means that I'm very acute about this specific distinction, which is the difference between product managers and business product managers. So in a lot of organizations, product management starts as an outgrowth of engineering that everyone has a CS degree. And at some point they start to scale, or maybe you're in an organization that's more, less, more flexible about the concept of having non-technical product managers. But at least at Google, they had the concept of product managers and business product managers. And the difference was product managers had CS degrees and business product managers did not. And the only, the only downside of that was when you looked at the product managers, you had a relatively low fraction that were women, and you had a larger fraction that in business product managers there were women. Like all my women role model, or most of my women role models, were actually business product managers. And the part that's really unfortunate about this distinction is that, at least at Google, there were certain things that business product managers were not allowed to do. They weren't allowed to have their own dev boxes. They couldn't have root on them. Uh, they couldn't have logs access, which was truly bizarre to me. Um, and if your organization is an organization like this, where you have a distinction between your technical and non-technical product managers, look really closely at this because there's a lot of things I was able to accomplish at Google because I had logs access, because I was able to bring the data to the argument and like scrutinize these kind of distinctions because you might find they're actually gendered kind of biases. The second is, oh, I didn't even notice that. Oh, there we go. Come on, go away. Ta-da. Um, uh, product management requires pushiness. Like probably a lot of you are familiar with the article that went around Twitter a bunch like a year ago. It keeps getting recycled like in the Medium article around the concept of pushing uh, 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 abrasiveness, right? That women when they're pushy are abrasive and when men aren't they're assertive. Um, unfortunately, product management inherently has this kind of element to it. You have to be a, to a certain degree a pushy person in order to be a good product manager. Like we help push things forward. We help make things happen. Um, go and if your organization isn't looking at words used in feedback, or if you're not or even doing feedback, have a dialogue with your company and ask, are we looking for biases like this? Because if you don't, you're going to see more and more women fall out of your product management uh, pipeline. The next is product management is inherently collaborative, and sometimes this can actually be a detriment to women. So as, as a woman product manager, it's really hard for me to talk about what I do, right? I talk a lot about what my teams do because like, I identify myself as a person in the context of my own teams. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of research on how women do this even more than men do. Like women aren't as willing to say like, no, I, I, I drove this product to launch. Like it's all me, you know, like I don't know. I, I just don't think that way. Um, unfortunately, uh, people get knocked down in things like performance reviews when they don't use I words. So making sure you take time to actually practice or like have someone, have a guy read your personal feedback. Like I always have a guy read my like personal statement before I submit it because I know I won't be an aggressive enough about like talking about how amazing I am. Um, and so I let the guy like guy it for me. <laughs> um, the next one is, uh, 
there are way fewer PMs in every organization than engineers. And this is, this is a good thing. Like, that's what PMs are here for. We're here to be like yeast. We make the bread rise. Um, at the same time, we are not the flour. You don't eat yeast for dinner. Um, and the downside to this is that a lot of the things that come with organizational scale, like being able to have um, HR functions that evaluate things like bias in feedback, are a lot harder to do in PM organizations. And so the big piece of advice that I have on this one is if your organization has a separate PM org and an end org, try to get them merged. At Google, when they switched over and started having a single organization, it was just like, it was a great thing. Um, because end orgs generally care a lot about things like attrition and how happy their members are. Um, and it's harder in PM orgs. So last thing, tips and tricks. So I'm actually really sensitive about giving advice on things like this because I don't want to like pull a leaned in and like blame the victim. But at the same time, like the world isn't fair, but I really want you to be in the world, right? Like I want you to be here. I want you to go on this journey with me. Um, I don't want to quit. I don't want you to quit. So this is just like my kind of, I don't know, personal experience advice. The first is be honest with yourself about the cost of being a woman in tech. So until I went to graduate school, I didn't understand all the ways that being in tech had changed me as a human being. So I went to business school, I met all these amazing women who had risen, risen to like their positions at General Mills, like creating new kinds of cereal, or uh, in banking, or in consulting, or all these places. And I was really shocked at the ways in which they were able to be a much larger spectrum of femininity than I often saw in my own mentors at Google. Um, and I think it's important to sit and like try to expose yourself to other kinds of experiences so you can see are there things about myself that are very important to me that I have felt like I couldn't really express in my job? Because that actually wears you down. Like if you want to stay in the game, you need to figure out ways to reduce like how you're being worn down. The second is um, build your social capital. So I'm a big proponent of sit with your engineering team. Like there are some organizations where you, people don't. Um, at Yelp, the tradition has been not to, and I, I just don't do that. I sit with my engineering team. Um, you learn a lot more. You become in depth, you are able to make better decisions, you can give better advice to your engineers because you actually know what's going on. The second is write documentation for your engineers. Um, like I'm, I'm, as a PM, I'm a very technical PM, but that's because I've written a lot of documentation for a lot of engineers because I wanted to learn. And it's a really nice trade-off where they're very grateful that you've helped them like not have to write documentation because <laughs> how many people like to write documentation? Um, and you, you get something great out of it, which is beyond the social capital, you, you become more adept at your own product. Like you can speak more intelligently about it or you know the trade-offs. Um, and lastly, do your own data analysis. This is really important too. Like I know a lot of PMs where they're like, oh, I won't be very fast at it. Like I have other things on my plate. Like there's a lot of reasons not to. Um, at the same time, it's really hard to know in advance the right questions to ask. And in the process of trying to answer them, you often find better questions to ask. And this has served me incredibly well throughout my career. Uh, the next is, uh, San Francisco is not the world. <laughs> it's really, I didn't realize how much this was in my head until I left. <laughs> um, there, just like I said, I didn't realize the ways that I had been worn down by being a woman in tech. Similarly, like, I didn't realize how much strength I could draw from seeing other models of femininity. So for example, the last team I was on at Google, it had a transsexual eng director. And as a result, we had more transsexual women than cis women on our team, which also says something sad about the number of women in tech. Um, but I was amazed, I was amazed getting to work with these people because they didn't care what the cost was of being a woman. Like, they were willing to take that cost because they knew they had to be themselves. And that was like an incredibly like eye-opening and like, vitalizing experience for me. The other two groups that have been particularly be um, helpful to me in my growth as like a human being and as a, as a woman in tech have been, I studied abroad in Sweden and I had all these classmates that were women and it was just like, it was a non-issue. They were like, women in tech is a problem? I don't understand. Like, don't women have fingers? Like, <laughs> <laughs> we can code too. Um, and it was just great, because I came back to the US and I was like, God, why would I put up with that shit? That sounds stupid. Um, 
And then the last group is Indian and American women. Like a huge fraction of my most important role models have been women who grew up outside the United States and India. And I think that's just because they have a lot larger tech population that is women and there's not the same cultural bias. Uh, second to last thing, uh, you don't have to accept bad behavior. Um, looking back at my time at Google, uh, there were a couple of times where I look back and I'm just shocked I put up with some of the things I put up with. So one was uh, I had a tech lead who wouldn't let me join the engineering mailing list for my own project. And I surfaced it to my manager and he surfaced it to the other guy's manager. And back then, like at Google, if you didn't want to get promoted, they didn't really fire people. So there was not like a lot of leverage. Um, and the second one was I had a fellow PM on a team who would yell at me in the hallway until I would cry. And I went to my manager and my manager like basically like slapped him on the wrist and was like, don't do that. <laughs> and it just didn't stop. Um, and it wasn't until after I left and the guy who I had mentored to replace me, I, I asked him one day like whatever happened to that guy? And he was like, oh, I just went to HR. Done. And I was like, oh God, why didn't I do that? That seems so obvious in retrospect. Don't put up with bad behavior. Like, it's really hard, the idea of like, oh, I should go over my manager's head to HR. But in reality, like, this, this is why women fall out of the funnel in tech, right? Like, there's shit like this. And we don't realize we don't have to put up with it. Um, and actually, I think this is also a symptom of the fact that we are a marginalized population in tech, is that we're afraid to go over our, our manager's heads to HR, even though this is just unacceptable. The last one is, and I, I hate to contradict the pre previous speaker, I really believe women should not work for companies that don't value women. Um, there are tech companies that really care, like Pinterest really cares. Like I know their founder, he's a great guy, he actively cares about this. If your company, after you raise these things, doesn't try to actively and proactively do things about them, don't work for them. Like, point blank. That's how the world changes. Like, women are an asset, and you need to treat yourself as an asset. And the last piece of advice I have for you, and I promise to stop preaching, is, um, <laughs> is embrace the long now, right? Like, in the Valley, and this is another thing I learned in business school, uh, we live on two-year horizons, right? Like, that's what VCs fund people for. They're like, no, we don't really, if you can't, like, make a, make a profitable thing in two years, if you can't, like, get rich and retire in two years, don't do it. And the problem with that is that's not how the world changes. Like, my mother was the first fa woman faculty member in her department to have a child. I was the first child to be born of a female faculty member in her department. She was a scientist. She was a cell biologist. And... Her mentor, uh, so my mother got tenure at 40. Her mentor didn't even go on the tenure track until she was 40. Like she worked as a researcher in her, her husband's lab up until like their, uh, their three children were in kindergarten. Her mentor never got on the tenure track, right? She worked as a lecturer until she retired. But my mother's mentee, she became the department chair of her department and had a kid, right? That is what progress is. And that took 65 years. And it should have taken two. It should have taken two. <laughs> but like I said before, the world is not fair, but you belong in the world. Like all of you, you don't belong in the past. You belong in the future. And you are of the future. And what you do today matters for the women who come after you. So like, I wouldn't be here today if Marissa hadn't been in my management chain, right? Like, when I looked at my mother and I saw what she accomplished, I was really critical of it. I looked at it and I said, God, you gave up a lot to do what you did. I don't want to do that. That sounds really, I'm a smart person. I don't want to do that. <laughs> and Marissa provided an incredibly different role model because she was unwilling to compromise, right? Like she could have quit Google years and years before she did and retired happily wealthier than she could have ever spent the money. And she didn't quit, right? And she, she didn't just not quit. She chose to continue to be herself, right? Like Marissa was the head cheerleader when she was in high school. Like it wouldn't make sense for her to stop being Marissa. Marissa is Marissa. And I am who I am today because I got to see her do what she did. And so the thing I always try to remember when I'm like having a truly bad day and I'm like, fuck the shit, drop the mic, I'm gone, um, <laughs> is I go, Maybe one more day. 
like if I do one more day, if I do one more month, I know I make a difference. I know I, I know I open up space for people to have experiences they wouldn't otherwise be able to have. And that's why I stay in it. And so I encourage you, like, even if you have a really bad day, either vote with your feet, which is also a totally legitimate option, but stay in tech. Like I want to be here with you in 10 years. So thanks. Thank you all.